Our next speaker is Robert Ferguson, president of one of the, uh, the best outfits in, in the country with regards to keeping track of the climate change and climate science issues. Um, his uh, reputation precedes him and his experience is extensive, vast, and in-depth. Thank you for coming. Go ahead, Robert. Thank you very much. I'll borrow a line from Christopher Monkton after that introduction. I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> well, we're going to play a little game of the board game Clue. You probably played that when you were younger, or played it with your kids or grandkids. And in the environmentalist game of Clue, the potential victim in this place is the plant and animal life of the planet, species extinction. And the perpetrators, I say, are all of you men who are Colonel Mustard and you ladies who are Miss Scarlet. So as we'll find out, though, the real villain ends up being Mr. Green. <laughs> One of the grandest of all the catastrophes predicted by climate alarmists to occur as a result of CO2-induced global warming is that many of the plant and animal species will not be able to migrate poleward in latitude or upward in altitude fast enough to remain within their temperature regimes suitable for their continued existence, therefore the model concept that we, they will be driven to extinction. The infamous claim has pervaded the thinking also of the world of climate alarmist uh, ever since it was first suggested, and it figures prominently in the gloom and doom predictions of the likes of Al Gore and Dr. James Hansen. Let me go up one. There we go. It has also entered into the scientific assessments of the IPCC, as you well know, where in their latest report it was projected that globally about 20 to 30 percent of the species will be at increasing risk of extinction by the year 2100 due to CO2 induced global warming. But are such, con such concerns correct? We turn to the literature. In an effort to find out, uh, last year, the Science and Public Policy Institute commissioned a landmark study by Dr. Craig Itzo and his father Sherwood that thoroughly examined the global warming extinction hypothesis. Yeah. After analyzing over 300 peer-reviewed scientific re articles, the results were presented in a book which we produced titled CO2, Global Warming and Species Extinctions, Prospects for the Future. The title is long, therefore it's got to be true. Over the next several minutes, I will briefly report to you only some of those findings, which I am happy to add, do not suggest significant portions of the Earth's flora and fauna will be driven to extinction as a result of the modern rise in CO2. At first blush, the extinction hypothesis does seem reasonable enough, all else being equal. But as you know, all else is almost not equal when changes happen in the real world. And the case in point is no exception. Accompanying the increase in air temperature over the past century, for example, and accompanying any temperature increase that may yet occur this century, there was and will be concomitant increases in the atmosphere's CO2 concentration. And the physiological efforts, effects rather, of this phenomenon, which are almost always totally ignored by the proponents of the extinction hypothesis, have some critically important consequences that dramatically alter the conclusions of the world's climate alarmist. In fact, these consequences actually refute their model calculations. As can seen, uh, be seen here in the circle that's in red, at 10 degrees C, elevated CO2 has essentially no effect on net photosynthesis in this particular species of plant. At 25 degrees C, however, where the net photosynthetic rate of the leaves exposed to 325 ppm CO2 is maximal, the extra CO2 of this study boosts the net photosynthetic rate of the foliage to nearly 90 percent. At 37 uh, degrees C, where the net photosynthetic rate of the leaves exposed uh, to 1,935 ppm of CO2 is maximal, the extra CO2 boosts the net photosynthetic rate of the foliage a whopping 475 percent. In addition, it is readily seen that the extra CO2 increases the optimal temperature for net photosynthesis in this species by about 12 degrees C. 
from 25 degrees C in the air at 325 parts per million to 37 degrees C in the air at 1,935 parts per million. In viewing the warm temperature projections of the two relationships, it can be also seen that the transition from positive to negative photosynthesis, which denotes a change from life-sustaining to life-depleting conditions, likely occurs somewhere in the vicinity of 38 degrees C in air of 325 degree, uh, ppm, but somewhere in the vicinity of 50 degrees C in air in which we have 1,935 parts per million. Hence, not only was the optimal temperature for the growth of the big tooth aspen, which is this plant, uh, greatly increased with extra CO2 in the experiment, but so too was the temperature above which life cannot be sustained increased by the elevated CO2 by about the same amount, which is 12 degrees C. And of course, one must also remember that the extra CO2 in the air nearly always leads to greater rates of photosynthesis and mass and biomass production, as well as a heightened ability to successfully deal with most naturally occurring environmental stresses and resource limitations for the plant. As a result of each of the CO2-induced changes in basic physiological behavior, Earth's plants will likely not be eliminated from large portions of the current natural habitats near the heat-limited boundaries of their ranges in the CO2-enriched world of the future. Even if temperatures were to rise as high as is unrealistically predicted by the IPCC and climate alarmists, because most types of vegetation, with the help of CO2, would be able to tolerate much warmer living conditions than they currently do. Simultaneously, as shown in this hypothetical example, at the bottom or the cold limited boundaries of their present ranges, they would have an opportunity to expand into areas that warmed and thereby invited their colonization upward in altitude and northward in latitude. Well, under Canada. Canada, yeah. <laughs> Hence, plants of a CO2 enriched and warmer world would actually experience increases in the size of the territories they could successfully inhabit making them not more likely, but less likely, to experience extinction. The exact opposite of what the modelers tell us. The same type of range overlapping will also likely apply to many of the world's animals that rely upon these range-expanding plants for their uh, food and habitat. Therefore, the end result of these several natural processes is the future in which there will likely be a great CO2-induced proliferation of regional biodiversity as opposed to modeled extinctions globally. And there is, there, there is much evidence from the peer-reviewed scientific literature to support this outcome. Highlighting a couple of examples that demonstrate the reality of this phenomena, in 2003, Walther et al. Uh, resurveyed the floristic composition of the uppermost 10 meters of 10 mountain summits in the Swiss Alps, applying the same methodology used in earlier surveys of the same mountaintops by previous researchers who conducted initial studies in 1905 and 1985. Consequently, the analysis covered the bulk of the Little Ice Age to the current warm period transition that we're aware of, that is from 1905 to 2003, the last portion of which from 1985 to 2003 is claimed by climate alarmists to have experienced a warming that is unprecedented over the last 2,000 years in terms of both the rate of temperature rise and the level to which temperatures rose. So what did they find? The three researchers of work reveal there was an 87% increase in species numbers from 1905 to 1985, and that by 2003, species numbers had more than doubled to 138% more than they were in 1905, and they were 26% higher than they were in 1985. Put another way, Walther et al. state that, quote, the rate of change in species richness from 3.7 species per decade of increase in species was significantly greater in the later period compared to 1985 survey in which there was 1.3 species per decade increase. So according to the alarmists, the warmer it got, the more species we had, not less. Nevertheless, they say, quote, the observed increase in species numbers does not entail the replacement of high alpine species by, special, by species from lower altitudes, but rather that they led to an enrichment of the overall summit in plant diversity. Consequently, in spite of the apparent reasonableness of the global warming extinction hypotheses, whereby high altitude species are expected to be squeezed out of existence or pushed off the planet, as Jim uh, Hansen says, 
by other species migrating upwards from the lower altitudes to escape the increasing stress of the rising temperatures, Walther et al. could find no sign of this dire prediction consequence over the entire century of supposed unprecedented global warming. Turning to an example from the animal kingdom, using data from the breeding birds atlas of the Lake Constance area, which borders Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Lamon uh, uh, et al. analyzed the impact of land use and climate changes on the abundance of Central European birds between the periods uh, 1980 and 81 and 1990 92, and between 1990 92 to 2000 2003. This work revealed in their words, quote, the total number of bird species in Lake Constance region increased from 145 species in 1980 to 146 species in 1990 and 154 species in 2000. While winter temperatures increased by 2.7 C and spring temperatures increased by 2.1 C over that 23 year period from the first to the last census. These and other data thus led them to conclude that, quote, increases and temperature appear to have allowed increases in abundance of species whose range centers are located in southern Europe, and that may, many have been limited, that may have been limited by earlier lower winter and spring temperatures, unquote. In addition, they reported that the impact of climate change on bird populations increased in importance between 1990 and 2000, and is now more significant than any other tested factor, which is very important finding because the warming has tremendously benefited the birds and helped to buffer them against extinction. Another example, this time from North America, uh, work by White and Kerr, as they described, report butterfly species ranges shifted across Canada between 19, 1900 and 1990, over a 90 year period, and developed a spatially explicit test of the degree to which observed shifts result in climate or human population density, the latter of which factors they described as reasonable proxies for land use changes. Within which broad category they include such things as habitat loss, pesticide use, and and habitation fragmentation, all of which atmospheric-driven factors have been tied to declines in the various butterfly species. In addition, they say that to their knowledge, this is the broadest scale, longest-term data set yet assembled to quantify global change Im impacts on the pattern of species. So we're talking about real data, real, real uh, experimentation here. This exercise led Kerr and White to discover that butterfly species richness, quote, generally increased over the study period results of range expansion among study species. And they further found that this increase, quote, from the early to late part of the 20th century was positively correlated to temperature change, which had, had to have been the cause of the change, but they also found that species richness was negatively correlated with human population change. Contrary to the doom and gloom prognostications of the world's climate alarmists, therefore, the supposed unprecedented and dread global warming of the 20th century has been nothing but beneficial to the butterfly species in the habitat of Canada. As their ranges have expanded, the great number of species now being encountered in most of the, er the areas of the country have also increased. Uh, there's another study which we won't get into here, which, which uh, talks about uh, other animals in, in the evolution or um, in, in the uh, ranges of growth for their habitat. Now, although, finally, I want to get into, we talk about frogs, the same, the same situation happens. I want to skip down to the final points I'd like to make here. In closing, I'd like to mention um, another critical point discussed in the book. In addition to staving off warming-induced extinctions, the case is made that ongoing rise in the air's CO2 content may be our last best hope for avoiding serious non-climate catastrophe that a cadre of particularly insightful research is found to be looming ominously on the horizon, but about which much less has been said or written. Although it represents a more realistic, more immediate, more dangerous threat to the well-being of man and nature uh, alike that, than a speculative CO2-induced inc global warming. This potential catastrophe derives from the fact that humans are on course to annihilate fully two-thirds of the 10 million species which we share with this planet simply by taking their land. Okay? This unfathomable consequence will occur simply because we will need more land to produce what is required to sustain us, and we will take the needed land from nature to keep ourselves alive. Yet in an erotic twist of fate, what many people believe to be the cause of global warming, that is anthropogenic CO2 emissions, may actually be the most powerful force to preserve the land 
in nature over what uh, we have any degree of control. Let's see how this is done quickly. Briefly, uh, Tillman et al. suggested a strategy for slowing the taking of wild nature that is built around three essential tasks. One, increase the crop yields per unit of land, increase the crop yield unit per nutrient supplied, and increase crop yield per unit of water used, all three of which tasks are brought about naturally via the manifold benefits of CO2 enrichment. Thus, as the air CO2 content continues to rise, so too will the land use efficiency of the planet, of the planet rise right along with it. In addition, atmospheric CO2 enrichment typically increases plant nutrition use efficiency and water use efficiency. Consequently, with respect to all three of the major needs noted by Tillman et al., increases in the air's CO2 content pays huge dividends, helping to increase agricultural output without taking new lands from nature. That certain forces and, and uh, interest groups continue to resist this reality is truly incredible. The more CO2 means more life for the planet. Less CO2 means death. Or as Will Happer of Princeton said, we live in a CO2-starved time. And not just death of individuals, but death of entire species. And to allow nay to cause the extinction of untold millions of the unique and irreplaceable plants and animals has got to rank close to the top of inconceivable immoralities. So considered in this light, we humans, as stewards of the earth, have got to get our science and our priorities straight. We have got to do all that we can to preserve nature by helping to feed humanity. And to do so successfully, we have got to let the air CO2 content rise. Any policies that stand in the way of that objective, therefore, are not only immoral, but are obscene. The exact opposite of what the modelers tell us. Thank you very much.